Hey everyone, welcome to the EMS Academy. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Berenholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins. I'm a member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack and medical director's office, EMS office, Chief Nats, EMS Training Academy staff, Captain Lenny Stewart, thank you guys. Thank you for what you guys do every day, and thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. A big shout out to Ashley Brooks, who's also a young member at Pikesville. Uh, Ashley is going to be helping us with our uh, Zoom platform. Uh, if you have a question or concern, uh, please reach out to Ashley via the chat. Ashley is also the one who later in this training will send out a link. Uh, click on the link, fill out some information and get your MIM CEUs. Uh, please stay on after uh, the training if you have any questions about your MIM CEUs um, or certificates of participation. So tonight, couldn't be more delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Bob Sikorsky. Dr. Sikorsky trained at the Robert Wood Johnson New Jersey Medical School Department of Anesthesia, Anesthesiology and Contingent Specialty Training in Cardiac Anesthesia at Deborah Hart Lung in Browns Mill, uh, New Jersey. He continued his career as a cardiac anesthesiologist and chief of a private practice group of cardiac anesthesiologists in New Jersey before coming to the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center at the University of Maryland. He now is the director of trauma anesthesiology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He's very active in resident and fellow education as well as trauma simulation. He's published many articles and textbook chapters on hemorrhagic shock, hemostatic resuscitation. His current research interests include trauma resuscitation, viscoelastic monitoring, the effects of the inflammatory response of coagulation, goal-directed therapy in critically ill surgical patients, as well as pre-hospital care of the trauma patient. He also currently is active in prolonged casualty care training with the 193rd Specialty Operations Squadron of the U.S. Air National Guard. I also, for many, uh, one another reason of the many reasons why I appreciate Dr. Sikorsky so much is that uh, Dr. Sikorsky and I were in the OR today and he was kind enough to take over my room so I could uh, get out of there. And he's also on a call tonight and yet he's still doing this training. So I am super grateful for that. Thank you so much for being with us, Bob. Thanks for the introduction, Sean. And thank you all once again for everything that all of you do out there. Uh, and when you come in with those patients, you make our job much easier. So um, that being said, uh, we're going to talk about whole blood. We'll, we'll get into a, a conversation here. We're going to take um, a close look at some things other than just whole blood. And hopefully you'll have an understanding more of where we are right now in our practice. This is a great shot of the inner harbor, but, but it lulls you into a sense of kind of false security uh, because usually uh, it's not going now. There we go. Uh, we refer to this as America's largest outdoor shooting range. So that's me. Uh, I came over here from the Shot Trauma Center. Uh, I'm active with uh, pre hospital uh, education uh, and uh, especially the Maryland State Police Aviation Command. I know a lot of people there. And, and uh, I miss uh, some of them a, a great deal. So uh, today we're going to talk about whole blood. And uh, we're going to talk about what, what's old is new again. And we're going to look at that journey in a little bit. You'll see uh, references to some of the military. Um, that's because I'm also active in some of the NATO special ops medical support through an organization called Thor, which we'll talk about later as we go through the remote damage control resuscitation protocol of the 75th Rangers Regiment, which we rewrote uh, a while back. So um, this basically is our friend. This is uh, what we are trying to accomplish, uh, both pre-hospital and in-hospital. Uh, once we treat our trauma patients, you can see fiber and mesh here. We can see activated platelets. We can see inactivated platelets down below, activated white cells and they all get caught in this mesh. Mesh, red cells are actually important as well. And we have some thrombin here that's collected. So this is our friend. But after we fix these patients, it becomes our foe. We battle phenothrombotic events uh, for up to 72 to 96 hours post-resuscitation. So again, in the initial phase, this is what we are trying to build, and we're going to talk our way through building it. Uh, my disclosures, um, I'm, um, I'm sorry, that just zipped through. 
uh, Verathon uh, Corporation, which is the Glidescope. I had a lot to do with some of the R&D with the inventor, Jack Patsy, uh, kind of did uh, some of the R&D as well on the uh, Ridges Dilent. Um, I get no money from any of these corporations that are involved in this talk, Edwards Life Science, Hemanetics, as well as Act Medical. I'm a senior consultant to a uh, small startup company. Uh, and eventually, uh, hopefully, we can talk about some of the devices that we're trying to develop. Uh, so what are you in for this evening? Uh, we're we're going to just take a quick run through that. Um, so we're going to talk about shock. We're going to define it, little food for thought, get the neurons uh, rolling here. Talk about traumatic induced coagulopathy and its components. We're going to look at coagulation, just very briefly talk about it and how the microcirculation of the small vessel flow is related to it. Uh, we're going to talk about resuscitation ratios in terms of component therapies. We're going to walk a timeline back from World War I up through the current day and just give you a little insight into some of the thought processes back when I trained in the 80s, uh, how things were so wrong, but we thought we were doing those patients a service. Uh, again, in retrospect, a huge disservice. Introduce you to the concepts of whole blood, EBO typing. We'll even talk about pre-hospital blood typing. Uh, and you'll be experts at um, EBO titers and blood typing. We're going to talk about O-positive blood as it relates to transfusion and what exactly are titers. When you hear everyone talk about whole blood, you hear low titer O positive whole blood, you're going to know a little bit and understand a little bit more about what we're talking about when we talk about low titers and why O positive, not O negative. We're going to look at a couple of systems that use uh, low titer O positive whole blood, talk about the essential partnerships that we have with the military, and then we'll conclude, try to keep us on schedule. I was outside of Philadelphia getting ready for a, a shock, hemorrhagic shock talk. And um, I went into a liquor store, don't hold that against me. And I saw this on the shelf. It was something called rum chata. I don't drink this, I'm a bourbon scotch guy. And um, I saw this and it, it got my attention because it had a leather coating on it and it had the threads of a football. So it had this almost like a pigskin feel to it. The reason why I took a, I bought it, took a picture of it, was because on the bottle, it said, do not throw or kick this bottle, meaning that someone actually tried to do that. Now, when we combine the inadequate use of one's brain power with alcohol, we know that bad things can happen. What it means for all of us, the take home point is we'll always have job security. That's how I look at it. Anyway, one other thing about never forgetting all the men and women who have given that uh, ultimate sacrifice for us. They're out there and hopefully never like to see them out there again, but the way things are going, we may uh, very soon. I don't have to answer that, so that's the best news. So let's talk about traumatic coagulopathy, all right? It's a complex problem to solve. The key is early recognition and treatment, and that starts with all of you pre-hospital. Coagulopathy, let's define it. It's a clotting disorder, but it's also a bleeding disorder. Now, we associate coagulopathy with a bleeding disorder, but it may not be the fact that the blood's ability to clot is impaired. And we'll see how that works into the big scheme of things here. So it's more of a clotting disorder, right? Patients will then eventually have a bleeding disorder if we don't correct it or stop that process. But the bleeding and trauma is usually caused by something else. Let's talk about some of the components of coagulopathy. I know this is about whole blood. We have to walk through some of the definitions. Traumatic-induced coagulopathy begins at the time of injury, and it um, starts, it, it kind of ramps up at about the 30-minute mark. It's a multifactorial failure of the system's ability to clot. So, there's a lot involved. It has to do with time down, shock, rate of bleeding. And what happens is we try to correct all of this failure, and we end up with the failure 
to clot, all secondary to bleeding, which we define as part of coagulopathy. There's two principles with trauma-induced coagulopathy. One is acute traumatic coagulopathy, which you've heard, and the other is iatrogenic coagulopathy. That's when you bring those patients in and the people with the short little white coats get a hold of them and start giving them bad things like cold blood without components, crystalloid cold, specifically if they start hanging something like normal saline, which is a big no-no. So this is caused by us as medical professionals treating the acute traumatic coagulopathy improperly. In the literature, you may see it as systemic acquired or resuscitation associated coagulopathy. Resuscitation associated coagulopathy can be the fact that we are just giving red cells. And what's in red cells? Well, in red cells, there are no factors, there are no platelets, but there are red cells. And in those red cells, there's a lot of things that chelate all those things that help us clot, primarily a cofactor like calcium. So what we're doing is in resuscitation associated coagulopathy, we're giving a non-hemostatic resuscitation. And that is what we'll see uh, led to our kind of look after um, a rack of high ratio resuscitation what led us to high ratio, meaning one to one to one in the civilian population post 2006. Remember I talked about coagulopathy being part of it being bleeding. Well, in trauma, the primary cause of bleeding isn't coagulopathy. It's disruption of large vessels, primarily vessels of a high shearing force, meaning arterial vessels. We can really get pressure and put a tourniquet on and mainly even pressure on low shearing force of vessels like veins, right? They'll usually stop. But the arteries, we really need surgeons to close those holes, or we need like cat 2s or any of the other tourniquets, even junctional tourniquets uh, like the Sam JT, something like that, that we could stop the arterial high shear force bleeding. In the capillary bed, what happens is we are dependent on in terms of bleeding, how extensive our tissue damage is, right? How high our injury severity score, because that leads to a myriad of different events in a cascade that really leads to something called hyperfibrinolysis. If we were talking about TXA, we would go in a different direction right here, but we're not. We're talking about whole blood. We'll mention TXA in a little while. And how long those patients are in shock. So how badly they're injured and how long or how, how deep their shock state is, how low that mean arterial pressure has been. There's something called the endothelial surface layer. It lines all of our arteries and it is almost like a brush border. And in that, there are various proteins. And those proteins actually can increase the inflammatory response but they're covered normally in all of us right now by plasma proteins. When we are in a degree of deep hypoperfusion, we have to get that volume from somewhere. We can get it from our capacitance vessels. We can get it from partly part of our liver. We can get it from the plasma along the endothelial surface layer. Problem is when we pull that plasma, we expose those proteins. And a lot of those are important in the inflammatory response, which we battle on a daily basis. How do we make things worse in these patients who are acidotic and hypotensive? Well, they're also hypothermic, right? Even in Iraq, Afghanistan, when they're in full battle, uh, full battle pack, and it's 110 degrees outside, when these soldiers are injured, or even civilians, they become severely hypothermic. Uh, and acidotic, and giving them crystalloid when they need things like component therapy or better yet, whole blood will make things worse. If we look at crystalloid and shock, crystalloid volumes pre-hospital are important, and you all know that. But the relevant cutoffs, and we've kind of been through this over the years, are between two and four liters. Now, it's tough to get two liters in somebody with a short transport time coming in, and with your knowledge, 
of limiting crystalloid in these patients unless you absolutely have to give them that crystalloid. You all know, and that's all basic knowledge. When they looked at crystalloid pre-op in these patients, or pre-hospital, I'm sorry, and these patients who are hypoperfused, Less than two liters, it's unlikely that we're going to cause a coagulopathy, regardless of how acidotic they are, meaning their admission lactate. Between two and four liters, they're at risk for iatrogenic coagulopathy, as well as them having a high admission lactate. So if they're hypoperfused, they're acidotic, when we're filling them with crystalloid, we're increasing the risk for coagulopathy. And if we give them more than four liters, regardless, of their state of hyperperfusion or their lactate on admission, they will become coagulopathic, which is the iatrogenic or system-induced coagulopathy. When we see these patients, we have on the left, this barrel is all of us. Now, the older I get, the more I look like a barrel, but I used to look like this can, but now I look like a barrel. This is contracted blood volume on the right, this can. Normal blood volume, is this barrel on the left. And this can actually sort of kind of lives in this barrel, right? When we use all of our peripheral volume, we end up with a contracted blood volume. But when we measure and we look at the labs and we compare the total blood volume to a contracted blood volume or normal blood volume, I should say, we can get the same numbers, hemoglobin 8.5, platelet count 100, fibrinogen 160, which are all normal, but low normal. The difference between the two with absolutely the same numbers is the contracted blood volume will have hypoperfusion and a base deficit of 12, where the normal blood volume, this patient will have a lactate of 1.5 and a very normal base deficit. The difference is that we have to fill this contracted blood volume on the right of the screen more with things that we lost, like component therapy and whole blood. Again, you saw how giving crystalloid will make things worse. This is actually something called incidence dark field microscopy. When I was at shock trauma, one of my colleagues had a probe about the size of, let's see, this small highlighter. And he put it under his tongue. And this is actually microvascular flow. You can see that he has single cellular flow through his capillaries. And in between where you don't see the single cells, you see plasma. Over here, there's pretty much normal flow. There's an artery down to the left, but we can see platelets and white cells. So what we're doing is we are actually influencing microvascular flow and the amount of crystalloid if we give it in these tissues. That's so important that we replace it with colloid, colloid that has factors, factors for coagulation especially when these patients have a high injury severity score and they've been on scene for a while and they're hypothermic. So this is what our goal is to restore. So what about acute traumatic coagulopathy? Let's talk about transfusion ratios and whole blood. So we gave a little background. We, I gave a little background here, but let's talk a little bit about this timeline. The first, ABO blood typing in whole blood was used back in World War I. Hence the title of this talk, What's Old is New Again. As we walk through World War II, whole blood became very difficult to get because we were fighting a different war. And at that point in time, it was difficult to get whole blood into two theaters, right? So we had a Pacific theater and European theater. So we found it easier to ship this a long distance. And remember, our shipping time was much longer than it is now. So people back then were donating their plasma. They were freezing it. They had multiple pools of donated plasma because, again, people were selling it because they were all feeling the, um, the financial strains of the war. But what started happening to the military was because there was pooled plasma, there was an increase in hepatitis in a lot of the soldiers. When we got to Kareel, so they stopped giving this um, life lives, uh, plasma and start really giving um, albumin. When we got to the Korean War, we learned a lot about whole blood from World War I and World War II. But again, logistic challenges over in the Far East, right, made it difficult to get whole blood there. However, it, we started to see 
kind of like the beginning, the infancy of the walking blood bank. Uh, I don't know if ever, any of you ever watched a show called MASH. You would see at times that they would be lying on a table giving blood into another soldier. And many times they would pull it out with a 60cc syringe and just push it into the other soldier. The Vietnam War, well, we ran into a little bit of uh, other problems. Uh, with everything that we learned in World War I, and World War II, and the Korean War, we changed our thinking. We started to think that hemorrhagic shock was due to hypovolemia and that the patients needed volume of any kind. It wasn't from blood loss. So we started giving these patients in Vietnam, we went more with crystalloid. And what that did was we were doing a great deal of harm. And we saw what we could do with just four liters of crystalloid. Well, these patients were developing ARDS, something called Da Nang Lung came from that war. And the thing that really helped us realize the the um, errors of our ways was the fact that we had medevac. When we had medevac, we shortened our scene times, we shortened our evac times. And because it became very consistent, our evac times in, in terms of getting those soldiers to like a rural one were about 45, 30 minutes to 45 minutes in Vietnam, as opposed to two hours in the Korean War. So by adding medevac um, to the system, we were actually able to take one of the variables of, of scene time and evacuation time and look more at our resuscitation methods. And we found that giving these patients high volume of crystalloid was bad. However, by the time that information got back to us, we were starting to use uh, more and more crystalloid in the civilian population. And at that point in time, it was thought that if we gave crystalloid and really ramped up the delivery of oxygen to these patients, meaning that they all had, they were all tachycardic, they had high cardiac outputs, driving up their mean arterial pressure. What we were doing was really causing the exsanguination of these patients. We were giving a non-hemostatic resuscitation. We were driving up their systolic pressure to get oxygen to the tissue. All we were doing was forcing crystalloid into their interstitial space, their third, sp third space, and making them more acidotic. So we, we really did a lot of harm back then, and, and I'm one of the people who trained back then, and that's what we knew. But we learned from our, our, our ways. In, in 2000, 2001 to 2016, we had enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom, and we learned a lot from um, John Holcomb and his group, and we started to look at whole blood because with component therapy, we weren't giving platelets early enough. So we learned that we needed to give platelets earlier, but to get platelets to those soldiers, especially at the point of wounding it to a role one was very difficult. So that really piqued our interest in, in whole blood. But when we got that data back from um, Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom, John Holcomb and his group actually looked at ratios. We really was one of the first time we looked at component therapy and ratios as it applied to survival. And this was in 2006. And that's when I got involved in, in looking at component therapy and eventually whole blood. So, so Bob, in 2006, can I just, can I just clarify? Yes, so again, so whole blood, I think that's pretty clear. The component therapy and the ratios. So you're talking about like, you know, do we give one FFP, one platelet, and one Paxo, or do we give correct? Two, so two, what we were doing at the that time, Sean, in quickly? the civilian population, we were giving three reds to one plasma to one platelet, all right? And they were having a difficult time over in in Iraq um, getting those platelets. So they got a renewed interest in whole blood. And that's when kind of it restarted again. Um, so when they went back in 2005 and looked at how they were giving components, which it was much different than we were doing in the civilian population. And my next slide, you'll see Matt Borgman's slide looking at those high ratio versus low ratio, meaning that high ratio is one, cell to one platelet to one plasma, as opposed to three red cells to one platelet to one plasma. So we, there was a big difference between the military and the civilians 
right in, in around 2006, which wasn't that long ago. Did that clarify? Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So in 2006, so in 2016 to the present, we'll get we'll get into low titer O negative and O positive one in a little bit. But in 2006, when they came back from Iraq, meaning Holcomb's group, Phil Spinella, Matt Borgman, uh, and their group, they called a consortium or a meeting with the military and civilian representatives. I represented shock trauma, went down there. There was about 30 of us that were down there. And we met with the group when they came back from Iraq. And we were at the Institute of Surgical Research at Brook Army. And it was about a three-day meeting. And they presented us this slide. This was the plate. This is Mac Borgman's original plate, later published in uh, the Journal of Trauma and Critical Care Surgery. Um, and this was the plate that, that when John Holcomb asked Matt Borgman and Phil Spinell to, why don't we look at the blood that we're giving to these soldiers and see if there is anything to the method or the ratios that we're giving them and how it applies to mortality or how it applies to survival. And they found that those soldiers that actually received more reds than plasmas or platelets had a higher mortality, right? Those who had more plasma or platelets had a lower mortality. And those who had almost this component recreation of whole blood had the lowest mortality. Now, when he showed us this, there was something called survival bias. And at that time, they were freezing their plasma. So by the time these soldiers would, who were severely injured had to wait for the plasma to be thawed, by the time they got the plasma, they succumbed to their injuries because they were getting a non-hemostatic resuscitation. So two things came out of this, ratios and thawed plasma in these areas uh, instead of frozen plasma. So we, if you look at some of the, um, the centers now, some of us have never thawed plasma or we carry thawed plasma like AB negative as we did in shock trauma. So this was the slide that started us looking in the civilian population at these high ratio, meaning one red, one platelet, one plasma. And when we came back, we decided from this meeting that we were going to change the way we resuscitated in the civilian population. So a couple of studies came out of this. Um, one was uh, the PROMPT study, and this was done in 2011 like, to 12, and it was published in uh, JAMA. A surgery in 2013, and it was an, uh, a prospective observational study, and they looked at how in the civilian population were we transfusing these patients? When were they getting platelets and red cells, and when were they getting plasma and red cells, and were they getting them in a timely fashion? When they looked at the distribution of plasma and platelets, meaning the ratios and they looked at them over time, this is percent, this is the ratio that they were given, and this was, again, time. So if we look at the distribution of plasma to RBCs, we can see that a high ratio resuscitation was kind of very rare in the first 30 minutes to one hour of the time. And this related to an increased mortality if they did not have a high ratio of resuscitation within the first 24 hours. And we can see within the six hours, um, a good number of the patients received high ratio of resuscitation. But in terms of when they were getting the plasma, now this was total plasma, right? So when they did the study, they were getting red cells and then they were thawing the plasma and then they gave the red cells and then they answered with some more plasma. They weren't truly getting a high ratio of resuscitation until two to six hours. So they had to wait for this thawed plasma. We know from studies that were done in 2008 by Holcomb that if we give platelets early, that makes a huge difference as well. So we looked at the distribution of platelets in red cells over time. And we can see that in the civilian population at that time, if we look at high ratio, meaning one to one to one, that patients weren't receiving a high ratio of platelets to RBCs for the first couple of hours. And if they had a delay up to six hours, that affected their 24 hour and 30 day mortality. 
So platelets early were really important. Plasma was important, but not as important early. So what we, what we kind of gleaned from the study was that we should be giving a high ratio early. What we also found was that the mean time to death from hemorrhagic shock is about 2.6 hours. So you can see before these patients actually got high ratios of what they needed, they were already dying of hemorrhagic shock in about that 2.6 hour mark. So that kind of made us think about an earlier time frame to give these blood products. Hence why our interest in pre-hospital component therapy in the whole blood began to start peaking. And we started to roll out some of the studies that would actually get us to where we are today. The next study was the proper study. Now, many of us were uh, involved in this study. And this was looking at initial ratios of resuscitation. So did plasma, platelets, and red cells in a one-to-one -one ratio make a difference in mortality when we compared it to a ratio of one plasma to one platelet to two red cells, more of a non-hemostatic resuscitation? A, a, a lower ratio of resuscitation than we saw from Boardman's slide, but that made a difference in outcomes. When they looked at 24 and 30 day, 24 hour and 30 day outcomes between the two groups, they noticed that there was no difference in terms of 24 hour mortality and 30 day mortality, which made us kind of think about do we really need high ratio of resuscitation? That was the primary outcome. When we looked at secondary outcomes, and we looked at survival early on, not 24 hour and 30 day, did these patients survive during the time that they were bleeding to death from hemorrhagic shock? And if we look at the two groups, the beige was the, high, the low ratio group, and the high ratio group was the blue, and we can see that they overlap. And they overlap all the way out, both in the 24 hour and 30 day mortality, except in one spot right here between the 1.5 and three hour mark, that median time right in the middle where patients die from hemorrhagic shock. So the one to one, the high ratio group, you can see that there's a plateau here and it's separated itself out. So a high ratio early on with these patients in the PROM study we're not getting meant the difference between their survival. So why, after that point in time, was there no difference in 24 hour and 30 day mortality? Well, that was our fault. That was partially my fault. And that is that those patients survived. How we broke protocol in the study was the surgeon said, patient isn't oozing and I think we have control of the bleeding. So we broke randomization, meaning we could give anything we want. If we look at the group that got high ratio, they're the beige, and the group that got low ratio, they're the blue. And after the surgeon said, we have control of the bleeding, those patients who got low ratio, meaning more red cells than platelets or plasma, we start giving them what they needed. And you can see post-intervention in both ratios of platelets to RBCs and plasma to RBCs. We gave them what they needed after the intervention. So that's why both the 24 and 30 day mortality kind of blended together. So in that primary outcome, there wasn't a difference, but it was because those patients got what they needed who were randomized to a lower ratio of resuscitation. Time is of the essence as well, right? We see that 2.6 hours is that mark. And they looked at, in this study, in a journal of trauma acute care surgery in 2017, they were interested in when those first coolers got there. And when you look at the American College of Surgeons, their uh, trauma quality program um, looked at the, re the recommended time that we need that first cooler when you are in the hospital. Now, if you give it pre-hospital component therapy or whole blood, it sets us way ahead of the game. But when those patients arrived, their recommendation was within 15 minutes, they should be getting high ratio of resuscitation if they need uh, a, a massive transfusion protocol or a massive transfusion event. And we could see that those who had disturbed physiology, 
a high revised trauma score and high ISS. And those who got low ratio, actually those who got low ratio had a higher odds ratio for 30 day mortality. In this study, the median time for MPP activation was about nine minutes, which was excellent. And the time to delivery of the first blood product was eight minutes. Now, for every one minute delay in blood product above 15 minutes, which was the American College of Surgeons recommendation, there was additional 5% increase in, in, in odds ratio of mortality, meaning that we have to recognize that and get it fast. Hence why it's so important, I think, to develop those protocols for all of you to start this free hospital. This is in hospital. From the proper trial, and all of us knowing that we don't want to wait that long for that plasma to fall, and this is the, the fridge of shock trauma, we had immediate availability of uncrossed match pack red blood, red blood cells of AB negative plasma and two packs. Uh, two six packs of platelets. So we had 10 OPAS, 4 ONEG for women of childbearing age. So we'll talk about that later. Six units of AB negative plasma. Well, you'll understand why AB negative and two six packs of platelets. So they were right there. So we could treat these patients with high ratio. As soon as they came in, they would then be treated if they were an MTP with TXA. We would get them started on a high ratio resuscitation and hopefully fend off that 2.6 hour median time to death from hemorrhagic shock. So in PEDS patients, it's much different, right? And when they looked at pediatric patients uh, in, uh, in Iraq in combat injured children, they looked at high ratio of plasma to RBCs and they didn't find a survival um, benefit. And also they were trying to find this optimal resuscitation strategy in critically ill injured and, and critically injured pediatric patients. And hence that takes us to step, what would be the optimal resuscitation strategy? And we'll see that with low titer, O positive whole blood in a little bit. When we look at the difference between component therapy and whole blood therapy, there has to be anticoagulation, anticoagulants in each of the components, right? Each bag has an anticoagulant in it. It also has something called Adsol-5 or Optazol, which actually gives ATP and energy and glucose to the red cells so their shelf life is longer. So this requires volume. So if we're giving a high ratio of resuscitation and, and in massive transfusion events or protocols, we usually give six of red, six of yellow, and one platelet, yellow meaning plasma. If we look at the amount of anticoagulants and additives in those six or one to one to one ratio, it's over a liter of volume that we're giving in that one cooler that we give these patients that are not related to coagulation, actually related to anticoagulation or red cell and carrying capacity. And a unit of whole blood, it's 63 cc's per unit. RBCs, it's 120 cc's per unit, plasma 50 per, and platelets 35 per. So again, in a high ratio of resuscitation, we're giving much more volume. If we give six units of whole blood, we see that's only 378 cc's of, of coagulants. We're giving more of components, coagulation, and oxygen carrying capacity. So if we look at component therapy and we look at the volume and concentration of red cells, if we look at the platelet count and how much of retained its coagulation factor concentration, meaning what percent our blood has about 100% of its coagulation factors, right? If we're not coagulopathic, when we draw it out in whole blood, we lose some. But in component therapy, red cell hematocrit's only 29, right? Normal should be somewhere from 38 to 45. Platelet count, well, many of us have a platelet count of around 175 to 300,000. Here it's only 80,000. Coagulation factors drop 65%. In whole blood, in a single unit, 500 cc's, look at our hematocrit, 35 to 50, normal. Platelet count, 150 to 400,000 normal. And coagulation factor concentration is, I'm sorry, 90%. So again, what we have lost 
we're giving back whole blood with good red cell concentration, good coagulation factors, platelets, which are really important as opposed to component therapy. And don't forget all of the additives that are given there. So what do we have in terms of comparing warm, fresh whole blood, meaning that if we take it from one soldier or someone in a walking blood bank and give it directly to another individual, as compared to cold stored whole blood, which we have in the civilian population. Well, warm, fresh whole blood is mostly military data. That's what we have because they usually give that right away in the walking blood bank. Room temp is 22 degrees, so that is warm whole blood, and it's warm when it's given. They're usually transfused by eight hours, so all those coagulation factors and red cells still maintain their oxygen carrying capacity. It's usually ABO specific because they have the ability to type uh, patients. Now, don't forget about 50% of those patients treated in theater um, are at the indigent population, so they don't know what their ABO blood type is. We'll talk about olden cards and the ability to type pre-hospital in a little bit. Most of the soldiers, we know their ABO blood type, so we can be specific, but the majority of them get low, titer, O positive, fresh, whole blood. Cold stored blood is in the civilian population, so most of our data comes from that. A little bit different, stored between two and six degrees. Hopefully we can warm it as we're giving it. Normal storage shelf life is 14 to 35 days. But when we, in a little bit, look at pre-hospital, we'll see that around 12 to 14 days is the average before they turn that blood in. It's usually group O. It has low titer anti-A and anti-B antibodies. And we'll look at that in a second, what that means to all of us. And it's low titer O positive whole blood. It's not ABO specific and it's not O negative. It is group O, but it's usually O positive. When we use or when we look at this whole blood and we want to decrease the amount of white cells in the blood, right? We want to decrease white cells in the blood because of the systemic inflammatory response. And some of these patients who donate blood are positive for uh, something called HLA. And we'll define that and look that up in a little while. But HLA antibodies actually are more the cause of acute lung injury or something called trolley. Uh, trauma-related acute lung injury in these patients who receive plasma. And we've, we've looked at HLA, uh, and we are, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit, but when we looked at whole blood and getting it here at Hopkins, we noticed that they were reducing the white cell count in the blood with two different types of platelet filters, one or leukoreduction filters. One spared platelets, the other didn't. So what we were getting, and kind of COVID gave us the opportunity to look into this because we held our whole blood program off for a bit. And we looked at the ability of these filters to reduce these activated white cells, and they were exactly the same. But one of the filters that was used by the uh, Minneapolis blood bank, which was non-platelet sparing, took all the platelet activity out of the whole blood, which now didn't make it whole blood, but made it an incomplete component in terms of therapy. One red, to one plasma, but the platelets were gone, which are really important. The American Red Cross filters were platelet sparing, which means we got a unit of whole blood similar to what we just talked about in terms of hematocrit, in terms of its factor concentration, in terms of its platelet count. So we actually had the Minneapolis blood bank because we get the whole blood from both change uh, from their one non-platelet sparing filter to the platelet sparing filter. So we had to be cautious because all whole blood isn't the same. When we look at ABO blood groups, we have to look at the red cells, and then we have to look at the plasma. There's different things going on in both of them. In type A blood, the red cells contain an antigen or these little particles that are called the A antigens. Now, the A antigens are what give us our type A blood type. But in the plasma, we have anti-B antibodies. So it's kind of a protective mechanism that we can attack things out in the bloodstream that aren't type A blood. So our plasma is the issue that contains the antibody. So type A blood has A antigen and anti-B antibodies. The next group, type B blood, has right B antigens, but in the plasma, they have anti-A antibodies. AB 
has A and B antigens, but we don't have any A or B antigens in the plasma, right? We would attack our red cells if we did. So that's really important because the A and B can't receive plasma that has either anti-B or anti-A antibodies in it. It would cause lysis or agglutination. And if we look at type O, there are no antigens on the red cell. They have none. But in the plasma, they have both antibodies, anti-A and anti-B. So we have four different blood types. But when we give red cells, right, we can give type O red cells to any of these patients because there are no, there's no plasma involved, right? They are washed of plasma. So we can give type O to any of these patients as long as we don't give anti-A or anti-B antibodies. The point I want to stop here and make a quick kind of frozen moment is that think about whole blood. We have red cells, we have plasma, and if we're using low titer O positive whole blood, we have O positive, we have anti-B and anti-A antibodies but we're giving this to everyone. And there's also another antigen called anti-D, which is attached in another way to the red cells, which means that's your RH. So you're either RH positive with those antigens or RH negative with those antigens. Now, women in childbearing age, we don't really want to expose them to RH positive blood because if they are RH negative and we give them RH positive blood, they're going to set up this antigen antibody reaction. And if they have a baby that is RH positive, they're RH negative, they've already been exposed to this O positive blood, which they are not. So what will happen is these antibodies will attack the baby's bloodstream because that placenta, as it separates, there's some exchange. And we can end up something something called erythroblastosis uh, fetalis, or we call it HDFN now. So we try not to give um, O positive or any positive blood to women of childbearing age, especially if they are O negative. So we don't know that, so we have to assume that. However, we're going to get into that a little more deeply. So remember, A, A antigen, B antibodies, type B, B antigen, A antibodies, A, B, both antigens, no antibodies, and type O, no antigens, both antibodies, important. And each of these blood types can have an RH antigen attached or not, which would make them positive or negative. So how can we tell if we don't have ABO typing? How can we do this in the field? What prolonged casualty care and TCCC guidelines and some of the units uh, who have um, prolonged extraction or long transport times, say out in the Midwest or out in the Southwest, they can actually use Elden cards and um, type uh, these patients for their ABO blood type and their RH um, blood groups as well. So the uh, Elden cards come with an alcohol swab. They come with a little pipette. Um, you stick the patient's finger with these lancets. There are four different kind of swabs that you have to use, each one for each one of these. Now, this card is impregnated with anti-A alloantibodies, anti-B, anti-D, which is the RH, and a control. We don't want that to agglutinate. If that agglutinates, that means the whole thing is off because we have a bad card. So that's our control. So what we do then is we stick the, the finger and we put a small little drop of blood in each one of these circles. And then we also pipette a little bit of that blood in here and we start mixing it. So we mix it with these swabs and we mix it around and we wait for about two to three minutes and we start seeing agglutination. So this patient has agglutination with their anti-A anti allobodies, right? So these, this patient has A antigen, there's A antibodies, so it's attacking the antigen, so it starts to agglutinate. When you look at Elden cards, here are the four. 
There's the A, the B, the RH, and the control. This patient did not agglutinate at all with any of the four, so they are O and their RH didn't agglutinate, so they're O negative. This one, remember, that they have no antigens, right? So this, by the A anti antibody and the B antibodies, there's no antigen on the red cells, so they're not going to agglutinate. But they had positive RH antigen, so they agglutinate. So these patients are O positive. And we can go down the line. These patients are, this patient is A negative, agglutinated in A, nothing in the positive for the RH, agglutinated in A, but agglutinated in the RH. Control is normal. All these controls are normal. So that's A positive. And you can go down the line, all of these. So we can do ABO blood typing. If your Eldon card looks like this, we have agglutination in B, agglutination in the anti-D or the RH. So we can tell that this patient, now the control is good, so we have a good card, is B positive. So again, we can test these patients in terms of ABO. What about looking, now that we know that O doesn't have antigens, but in the plasma, there's A and B antibodies. Right, And we don't know if they're RH positive or RH negative, but yet we have low titer, O positive, whole blood that we're giving to everyone. So how does that work out? How do we not kill people here? And that's not our goal, right? Our goal is to resuscitate them and have them survive. If there's a problem with O positive in terms of having both antibodies, right? Why, and there's an RH issue with women of childbearing age, why don't we just give O negative whole blood to everyone? That will solve that problem with women of childbearing age. Well, O negative blood is only in about 8% of the total population of which 4% are males. Now, this is important because women of childbearing age, the more pregnancies you have, the higher your titer of um, the HLA engine. And what happens is that when you donate blood, to males who are HLA negative, and they get a lot of that plasma, that increases their incidence of lung injury. So as of now, we've really taken females of childbearing age out of the donor pool for both plasma and a fresh whole blood. What we're starting to do with them is test them for this HLA. And if they're HLA negative, then we allow them to donate whole blood. The problem is O negative is a very small part, even of the worldwide population. So that's 3% only, and we need to protect the stores of O negative whole blood. O positive, however, constitutes about 40% of the population of the U.S. And a large portion have low I anti-A and anti-B titers. Remember, O positive, no antigens on the red cells, but A and B antibodies. So if we give that to other patients, right, who have A and B antigens on the red cells, those antibodies will attack the red cells. However, if we're giving it to trauma patients and there's a low amount of that A and B antibody, those trauma patients are also immunosuppressed. So their immune response is going to be low. So we find that there's a specific magic number that we like to look at in terms of titers. And we'll talk about what that means. In terms of titers, an anti-A and anti-B titers, which are IgM and IgG antibodies, lower than one in 256, meaning that if we take this dilution or this diluent of antibodies and we add volume to it in the one to one, one to two, one to four, one to 16, and we dilute it out, we see at what dilution do those antibodies don't react. Right. And if they don't react in a one to two, that means the amount of antibodies in that blood that's getting diluted or the plasma that's getting diluted are really low. That's the best. So we know that if we give this to trauma patients, the lower that titer, the better the patients will do. So in most places, they look for O positive blood that have low titers. My O positive blood, I have a very low titer, less than one, one to one. And now when we talk about titers, we're talking about one to 128 or one to 256. But in the literature, you'll say less than, you'll see less than 128 or less than 256. The military, 
when they looked at O positive blood in over 500,000 transfusions. Now in the civilian population, we're looking at really low titers. What they found was transfusions of titers less than 1,000, which means a lot more antibodies and trauma patients may actually be safe. They didn't really find an increase in hemolytic reactions or agglutination, meaning the, the red cells are clotting. And they found that that was pretty safe in 500,000 transfusions, and it may be because trauma patients are immunosuppressed. So 65% of men covered that. So there's something called human leukocyte antigen, which increases with consecutive pregnancies. And when we give this to men, um, primarily men or women who are HLA negative, their increase for um, acute lung injury increases. How, well, how have we been doing in the nationwide analysis of whole blood? Well, we found that whole blood in the beginning as an adjunct to component therapy, sort of like we're doing here and what they're doing in shock trauma, um, we at, start with whole blood and add it to component therapy, actually improved survival when it was compared to component therapy alone. And there was a decreased length of stay, and overall major decrease in morbidity and mortality. When they looked at children using warm, fresh blood, they found that warm, fresh whole blood was independently associated with these children surviving. And that was primarily in children without serious head injury. And now we're going to be seeing trials using low titer O positive whole blood in children. Phil Spinell in Pittsburgh is about to start one uh, as well as TXA in children in the same study. So we found a better way to treat pediatric trauma with better outcomes, and that's with whole blood. When we look at the PAMPER study group and what they did, this is New England Journal of 2018, they looked at about 500 patients and they were treated pre-hospital. And this is looking at um, like 30-day mortality, 24-hour and 30-day mortality. They were treated with pre-hospital plasma or just standard of care. No plasma, crystalloid, low crystalloid. And they found just the addition of plasma in those patients with hemorrhagic shock made a difference in outcome. When we looked at um, military uh, data, and this was again in JAMA 2017, and what they did was they matched these um, trauma patients who um, did not receive plasma pre-hospital and or blood products, and those who got uh, transfusion, and they matched them in, in, in terms of their mechanism of injury, whether they had head injury, chest injury, limb amputation, penetrating wounds. And they saw a dramatic decrease in 30-day um, mortality in those patients who got pre-hospital component therapy as, composed to those, as, a, as compared to those who didn't. When there was a secondary analysis of that PAMPER trial, it was looked into a little more detail in those patients that got crystalloid, that got plasma, red cells, and that got RBC and plasma in terms of their survival. And we can see that those patients who got crystalloid had a lower mortality for every, or had a higher mortality. And those patients that got red cells and plasma had a lower mortality for every unit of red cell and plasma that they got. The higher their component therapy, the higher their ratio, excluding platelets, the lower their mortality. And for every increase in a X amount of volume of crystalloid, they had a higher mortality. So preoperative crystalloid had the worst survival. When we look at whole blood and severely injured trauma patients in the civilian population, this is UPMC, the Mayo Clinic, UT in San Antonio, UT Houston, which we'll take a look at their system very momentarily. We can look at, they give different titers, right? One to 256 is, is good, but one to one, one to fit, or one to 50 or less than 50 is the best. We can see that their shelf lives vary, their titers vary, and the amount of pre-hospital and in-hospital blood that they use. And there's really still not a consensus in terms of what is the optimal shelf life for whole blood, right? And just as components have a limited amount of time on the shelf, whole blood does as well. And it's been shown that 
their platelet count decreases, their fibrinogen decreases, but their ability to clot for some reason increases. And there are some other, um, there are other components in the blood that are not in the purview of this discussion that may increase, but they haven't been tested yet. So even though some of the storage lesions occur, the whole blood still maintains its integrity in terms of clotting. In a review of all the literature, and we can look at 24-hour mortality in terms of outcomes, you can see that there's varying degrees of studies going on and looking at mortality. And once again, some show lower mortality, some show no significant difference, some show improved survival, and some show no, most show no difference. And that's looking at two different comparisons, comparisons, whole blood, to component therapy, some whole blood with component therapy with the addition of whole blood. So there's really no consensus in terms of 24 hour mortality or even 30 day mortality. We can see that across the board, some show that there's a survival benefit, some show no difference. And that also depends on some of the, um, the uh, cohorts of patients that were used and how that blood was given. However, still no consensus. However, the one consensus is that if there is a survival benefit, the earlier those patients get whole blood, it tends to actually maintain or restore early integrity of the coagulation system. So why it's so important? And we know that 2.6 hour mark is when those patients die. So let's talk about how this applies to the real world, okay? We've talked a lot about theory and some of the studies we know whole blood is good. We know component therapy is good early on. We know one patient's die. So that we are involved in something called THOR, which is trauma hemostasis and oxygenation research. This was back in 2014. And this THOR conference was founded by Phil Spinella, which you heard his name many times mentioned. This gentleman sitting in the back with the beard. He is the medical commander of the Norwegian Special Forces. And a lot of these other guys in here are all part of the military, except for this guy here, who's a civilian, but I work with them. We were sitting, and this is 4.30 in the morning in the back of a pub in the hotel. Uh, and this is a working conference. This is not a drinking conference. We had no idea it was 4.30 in the morning. And we were talking about lactate and shock index and getting whole blood early and using freeze-dried plasma and all these things, TXA. And what Andrew, Andrew Cap, Andrew Cap is the director of the NATO Blood Bank. He knows more about platelets than any person in this world. These are two members of the uh, 75th uh, Rangers Regiment. It's another SOF, a special ops officer. Uh, this is Pat Thompson. He is a, uh, a British, uh, basically the equivalent of a British SEAL dive um, instructor. So what we're doing is we were talking about this, and Andre was writing it down. And I was droning on and on, and so were all of us. And what we did was we did something pretty incredible. What came out of this article and the, the people that are there uh, in that picture of all of us underlined, actually, Andre at the end, which is 4.30 in the morning, he looked at all of us and he said, we just rewrote the 75th uh, Ranger Reg RDC R protocol. And we went, took a shower, we're back in the conference room at about eight o'clock in the morning with a bunch of coffee and we presented kind of what we found. And um, we combined shock index with this. Now we know shock index, right? Is your heart rate over your blood pressure and a shock index of about 0.7 is what we are all living at. And when that heart rate moves up above that blood pressure, we're talking about a shock index of one or greater and that increases mortality. And, and in this study, when they were looking at massive transfusion and shock index and pulse pressure, pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastolic, they found that a pulse pressure less than 45 and a shock index greater than one, both predictors of hypoperfusion, had the highest predictive value in these patients needing a massive transfusion. And when they looked at elderly patients, the predictive value was incredibly high in patients who are above the age of 85 who had a narrow pulse pressure, meaning that you're vasoconstricted and had a shock index greater than one. So those patients need this pre-hospital blood or in-hospital component therapy and whole blood much more quickly than everyone else. 
So this is the 75th Bridge Rangers protocol. This is what we came up with. They modified it since then as it went up the chain in the protocol. So these patients had signs and symptoms of hemorrhagic shock, one or more amputation, or blunt penetrating trauma. They needed a junctional or abdominal thoracic tourniquet, uh, and they had initial life-saving interventions. They initiated the call for fresh whole blood. They got access. They got one dose of TXA. Back then, it was one gram. They assessed them in terms of perfusion, right? They looked at their pulse. They looked at their mental status, uh, what their lactate and shock index was. And if they met this need for fresh whole blood, the call on the radio went out, Rolo, 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 which is Ranger O positive, low titer blood. And that's what they called for. That's their signal to get blood. When they got blood, they took their shock index. It was greater than five, finger stick lactate, uh, greater than one, finger stick lactate, greater than five, meaning they're hypoperfused. They were hypotensive and tachycardic. They got freeze-dried plasma until whole blood was available, and then they got a unit. They were reassessed. If things straighten out, their lactate came down, their shock index improved, well, they held out until they got evac, but they continued to reassess. If they reassessed in 20 minutes, their shock index was good but their lactate went up, their blood pressure was good, and their pulse was less than 100. Now, look, the only thing that happened was their lactate went up. Everything else was good. Here, they were told to reassess. You would say, well, their lactate went up. Well, their lactate went up because we washed it away from the hypoperfused periphery. If they reassessed and they were good, they waited. If their shock index went up greater than one and their lactate was bumped high that means they needed another unit of whole blood and we started it again if they maintain a low lactate as well as other parameters they reassess and they wait for evac so this all comes into kind of play at the point of wounding now instead of getting these soldiers to a roll one before they get transfused, they have a blood bank, a walking blood bank at the point of wounding. Talk about getting them that perfusion as early as we possibly can. Now we've taken this, and we'll be done in a couple of minutes here. We've taken this, and they done especially in the San Antonio area, to a large system-wide use of fresh whole blood. This is the San Antonio area. They have various districts in the area, and there are supervisors in each one of these districts, as well as special ops units. Now, each of these special ops units, there's only two in the district, so they usually go to every call. They have a unit of fresh whole blood in a cooler, and we'll talk about what cooler they use in Broward. Uh, they use a different cooler here in San Antonio, and the supervisors also carry a cooler with fresh whole blood. Now, they have certain times, and, and we'll look at that, that they circulate that blood or return it back to the South Texas Tissue and Blood Center. So they constantly have unused blood that's returned and they get new units. So they have a very system-wide, very um, protocol-driven uh, way of giving whole blood free hospital. So this is a blood box by Thermal Logistics. Uh, there are plates that go in here. They're changed out every 24 hours. This is really Broward County. There's another box that's used in uh, the San Antonio area. This has a cold line of about uh, zero to six degrees. The box that's used, it's another, um, another uh, product that's used in the San Antonio area, holds the blood at about zero to four degrees C. So um, they keep this blood in the units on the um, supervisors' uh, wagons and the uh, special uh, ops unit that go to every call. And um, they keep track per unit of how much blood is being used. So what they do is they've identified hot zones, those zones where they use the most blood. So when they get a call, and the protocol we'll look at next very briefly, that those Special ops units and the supervisors who have those units will actually end up in the scene, and there may be a cross coverage with another supervisor that they'll get three units to that one hot zone. 
and we could kind of identify what the hot zones are. Right? You could see that there were 59 units in uh, zone one, only eight were returned. So they had an 86% rate of giving that blood. And again, we can see that a lot of the other zones, a couple of other zones had low return and high percentage of giving that blood. So they identified those areas uh, by the amount of blood used and the type of trauma that was predominantly, um, that, that they predominantly encountered in that area, high blood loss trauma. Over all of the 363 units that were given out, they transfused almost 70% of them. The rest were returned back. Only one of these 363 units actually made it above the cold line, meaning it got to about eight degrees centigrade. And what they do here, as opposed to, I know in Maryland, what we would do is we would discard that unit, but there, they looked at it, they inspected it, they looked at it for agglutination, and if it looked good, they used that unit. And when they used that unit, they found no untoward effects with that unit. This is basically their protocol. You know, they look at a very quick history, medical condition, is the patient on blood thinners, calcium channel blockers, that doesn't allow the heart rate to go up, right? We're looking at shock index as well. They use the MARCH protocol that we use in uh, TCCC guidelines. Again, you all know that. I'm not going to go through that for the sake of time. They have low titer O positive whole blood. The majority of their blood is less than 1, 256 titer. Um, if the patient meets criteria for hemorrhagic shock, uh, also relative contraindications, young children are under six, but they do give whole blood, as we saw, there's a survival benefit to children. The patients have religious objections. Obviously, they won't get the blood. And again, they look at this actual clinical signs and protocolized methods of determining the hypoperfusion and that patient's need for giving whole blood early. And this is the call of the supervisor who arrives, and they can also get uh, a consult via telephone, a telecon with uh, the uh, nearest trauma center to determine if they should start whole blood or how much they should give. There's also other ways that we can stop blood. You all know that, right? There's, there's Rebola, a uh, resuscitative endovascular uh, balloon for inclusion of the aorta. Uh, we use this uh, in hospital, but again, there's multiple uh, deployments of this in theater um, and they've been successful. TXA uh, is given uh, and pre-hospital as well. Um, you have a protocol here in the state uh, and well, there's nationwide protocols, right? We have quick clot. What quick clot does is it actually starts the intrinsic coagulation pathway and actually uh, increases uh, clotting by uh, starting that one branch of the uh, intrinsic pathway. Combat goes as well. It's a hemostatic agent. It also does absorb um, other water or plasma and kind of, kind of concentrates those coagulation factors at the point of wound uh, can be used in combination with packing if you have a deep wound. Uh, so I don't know if you use uh, the foam here, the expanding foam or XStat, uh, something we're trying to develop is simple, similar to XStat, but it doesn't have the cellulose sponges or pellets that are released. Um, I can't tell you more about that because of a non-disclosure agreement. So we have a lot of non-blood, but, um, not a resuscitative manner in, in stopping blood now, but the majority of it is going to be low titer, O positive, whole blood that we're giving to the population. Now, when we look at some of the problems involved with low titer, O positive, whole blood, and spreading it out across the United States in terms of, of pre-hospital, we have some issues that we have to deal with. One is finding and obtaining adequate sources of the blood, right? Do we have enough O positive out there and O positive flow tighter? We have to really prevent waste of the donated blood, and we have to have a way of managing it, keeping that coal line and getting it back to the uh, hospitals when it's reaching its end of life um, time in, in the field, and usually about 12 to 15 days. If we get it back, they can centrifuge it back to its component therapy, 
to pull them apart and use that as component therapy so it doesn't go to waste. We really need to look more closely at uh, appropriate triggers for infusing whole blood, especially pre-hospital. We need those tight protocols and the ability to consult. Um, the appropriate equipment and training, this is a big process, but once it gets going, we find that it really improves uh, survival and lowers mortality. We need sustainable funding, right? That's always a problem now, getting that money behind what we need to do. Um, we need to actually look at the San Antonio, kind of the Broward County method of doing this, where we identify hot zones where some of that whole blood could be concentrated and have the ability to move it around if we needed it. It really requires good teamwork. And again, uh, we need those response teams, right? Those supervisors, or those uh, specialty uh, units uh, for response. So what we're looking at is low titer, whole blood. Now, remember we talked about, and I'm just gonna mention this very briefly, I've gone kind of over my time, but I think we're still right in the time slot here. What if we give this low tighter O positive whole blood to women of childbearing age? Well, for them to develop a problem with subsequent pregnancies, right? First of all, if they have a low exposure, you can give them Rogam, which actually prevents the formation of antibodies toward that O positive baby if they should have a baby that is RH positive. If they receive a large amount of blood, they may be sequestering some of those antibodies in their spleen and may require exchange transfusion. The interesting thing is when Phil Spinella and his group presented this data to a group of women who lost babies to HDFN, they stopped at mid-presentation and said, wait a minute, you're not giving O positive, low titer whole blood to women of childbearing age? Why is it up to you that makes this decision? It should be our decision. We want to survive long enough to have a child. So if we don't survive, we're never gonna have that family. We'll deal with the consequences. And actually now, this group of women who actually lost infants to HDFN because they got O positive blood, probably high titer, actually were on the American Association of Blood Banks board of kind of their steering committee to kind of re-steer the thinking of using O positive blood in women of childbearing age. So to recap, you know, it started with whole blood. We went to component therapy because of the availability. We learned a lot that we were doing wrong. We came back from Iraq with information of low, of high transfusion ratios. We partnered with the civilian population, which was my side of the story, and we kind of converted that to high component therapy. But then we start looking at the data and we start looking at what we were transfusing these people and what they were really getting. And that was more anticoagulants, more Adsol, more of those things that they didn't need. And they were getting those components in a lower volume. So now we're pushing toward whole blood. I think whole blood is in, that, in the future. And um, some of the future may actually whole freeze-dried whole blood. Wouldn't that be lovely if we had that, right? Uh, ABO compatible. The ability to get that in early, life lies it and give that to patients. The shelf life would be probably um, infinity. You know, we don't know what it would be, but it would be much longer than months to carry that, and every unit could carry it. So again, that's what the future holds. We'll pass that torch off to all of you. And right now, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Wow. What a ton of great info. What a great story from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Anyone out there besides Sun and Silence? Bunch of thank yous and outstandings rolling in. Thank yous. Thank you for your service. Well, my service is as a civilian, and I uh, hope to take care of these people who actually put their lives in danger. And I, I do work with the military, but they get all the credit. Um, you know, uh, so 
I, I really have to uh, tip my hat to guys like Phil Spinella and John Holcomb and Matt Borgman and, and all of all of you who serve and all of you. Thank you out there for your service. Um, that uh, that to me is service to uh, to all of us, especially in the state of Maryland. Well said. All right, Bob, I think just a bunch of incredible presentations and thank yous. I'll send you some feedback, um, whatever we get on the sign-in sheet. We super and appreciate please, you. Any, any of you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Barinholtz, Sean has my email. He has my contact information. If you want references from this, I will give it to you. If you want to review, it's, it's recorded, but I'll give you all the references, the bibliography, anything that you guys want, questions that you may think of later as you're practicing please feel free to get back to me. Oh, and you had given an update we talked about today that uh, uh, MSP uh, still doesn't yes. quite have blood on board yet, but they're still- They don't have blood on board. They've all been trained. They have the units to maintain the coal line. They have warming units to give a blood. I know Nathan Wheelock was out there somewhere, so um, he can probably address this better than I, but they don't have the whole blood yet, but they are ready to go. As Nathan said, it is close. It is close. Bob, thanks again. We super appreciate you. Uh, I have someone for any thoughts or studies for more austere environments with several days delay in transport to shock trauma or mm -hmm. maybe transport to a role one. So what we're looking at is austere environments. And that's kind of what we're working on now. Um, it's actually the Air National Guard that I work with at the 193rd, and we're using TCCC guidelines to actually um, kind of re remold or remodel the, the prolonged field care to prolonged casualty care. Um, there is some data out there. I can share that with you in studies in terms of um, time. Uh, but again, um, a lot of the data that we looked at with whole blood and we're looking at the 75th Reg uh, Rangers uh, RDC protocol, the remote damage control resuscitation protocol. Um, there is a, a couple of really nice papers done by Andy and uh, on Ethan Miles uh, on what they found with that um, austere environment. Um, I can actually, if you send me an email, I don't, uh, it's Jay Clement, so I don't know uh, your first name, but if you can send me an email through Sean, um, I will get you all of the uh, the studies uh, for austere environments and um, prolonged uh, casualty care. Excellent. Do you see a role? Uh, do you, Good. I, I have a. Do you see a role for AI in uh, crafting new? Um, perfect. Um, I'll get those to you. And you see creating new synthetic particles to become more effective blood substitutes. Um, I don't know. I think Phil Spinella right now at UPMC is working with some AI in crafting um, component therapy of a lifelized uh, kind of um, almost semi-synthetic red cells but they have a lot of the hemoglobin properties, not like the, the uh, synthetic um, particles that we have now. And what he's doing, he's separ separating, out, separating out the components and then being able to, in the future, almost like a, a boutique blood, what do you need more of? Do you need more cryo? Do you need more fibrinogen? Do you need more factors? Do you, do you need some red cells, but not a lot? And to combine those um, and and in a lifewise kind of um, dehydrated manner to re reconstitute those. So those red cells are gonna be kind of like semi-synthetic particles because we can't really dehydrate those and maintain the ATP in the membrane. So Phil Spinella, uh, stay close to that coast. Uh, there are uh, some, there's some work being done. Uh, follow Phil and his work up at UPMC. They're, they're really uh, starting to look at that. Awesome. Any other questions? 
I think that's it. Bob, thanks so much. Back Thank to you, Sean. Thank you all. Thank you all for your service to all of us in the state of Maryland. Can't, can't live in this state without all of you. Appreciate you. Have a good call. Thank you. Thanks.